What's going on, guys? Welcome to another episode of Eastern Current. I think this is episode 31, right? I think you said that last time. It's episode. <laughs> we'll figure out what episode it is. It's, we're, it's, it's, they're starting to run together a little bit, but I got my trusty buddy Cam over here, Cameron Pappas. Do you go by Cameron or Cam more? I, I, I tend to like Cam better. I There'll like. be like three weeks where I'll call you Cam, and then I'll start calling you Cameron, and then I'll start calling you Cam. Anything works. But this is Cam Pappas here, uh, <laughs> my, my left hand man. Um, we're super excited about this show. Uh, it's it's something that I'm real passionate about. I always get like such a drive this time of year to to start shad fishing and striper fishing. And February is it seems to be really when it kicks off. So we're excited, um, and we're excited about episode whatever this is. But I'm gonna I'm <laughs> gonna do a little uh, a little sponsor shout out real quick. Let's see if this pops up there. There we go. We want to thank Marshwear and Afco, two awesome clothing and uh, gear companies that uh, that partner with us in co promotion and do a bunch of giveaway stuff. We're gonna start doing some more giveaways here. A little bit later in the winter, getting back into the spring, try to jump the jump the viewership up a little bit by doing some giveaways. And so uh, be tuned in. Actually, next show, though, we're going to give away some free tickets to the uh, the seminar series up out of um, Noose River Bait and Tackle. Mm-hmm. And we're excited about that. So, so make sure you tune in next week and you can potentially win um, some free tickets to that. There's going to be some awesome guys talking about just different – fisheries around the the um carolina coast here so but yeah marshware afco eastern angling that's my guide business they just are huge supporters we really love the guys <laughs> over at eastern eastern angling um, and then i strike fishing is uh just such an awesome company dave and ralph are great friends uh, they make great products and just really really cool down to earth guys um, if you ever are down in south carolina fishing or need some help down there give them a call if you need some uh, maybe some new jig heads or, or any type of tackle that they create uh, check them out online there's some great discounts there um they make some really unique jig heads too. Yeah, some real unique stuff, and the big eyes on them. I love it. Big eyes. What's your favorite eye strike product? I, you know, I haven't even used it yet, but I'm really excited this year to try their sheep's head. The jail bait. Yeah, the jail bait. I'm really excited to use it. The putting. I hate tying Carolina rigs. Yeah. So oh, yeah, using one of those things. Yeah, it's just one knot, tie it on, you're good to go. Yeah. And you got two hooks, so you can freaking jack those things. I hate when they <laughs> yeah. sitting there. You've fed them like 15 fiddler crabs on a Carolina yeah, rig, and you're like, oh, it's probably a probably a sea bass. They're bait stealers. But it's always no the sheep's head. I think the sheep's head are just incredibly good at stealing bait off a of Carolina rig. Yeah, they are. Yeah. It's oh, crazy. you'll feed like sometimes you'll feed 15 crabs to them before. You, you get them on the other end of the line. I remember you and Jeff were fishing one day, and y- y'all said that it was really clear, and you could actually see them coming up yeah. and just eating the crab <laughs> from underneath the hook and not yeah. getting the hook. That's crazy. But, yeah, so Marshore, AFCO, Eastern Angling, and Ice Strike. We're going to come back over here real quick. Um, if, the, if I'm screwing anything up, just say it in the comment section. I'm still learning, you guys. I'm a slow learner. <laughs> so uh, help me out by just shooting it over in the comments. And if you're listening uh, on the podcast platforms, thank you for tuning in. We love you guys. We don't get to, get to talk to you live, but – um, that is kind of the bread and butter of this whole operation is, is really trying to grow that, that podcast platform. If you're not, uh, if you don't follow us on Instagram, go over and follow us on Instagram. Um, you can follow us here on Facebook and then also go subscribe to the podcast channel. That really helps us out. Leave a review, hopefully a five star. If it's not going to be a five star review, then don't leave it at all. Yeah, just, um, we're, we've just got five star reviews cause you know, we just have some, <laughs> I have about 50 people that I could have texted on my phone to give me a five-star view, and that's where we're at. So you could help us out by, by leaving a five-star view as well. But, guys, we're going to bring on our guest, Captain Will Paul. Can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you guys. How's it going? What's going on, man? We, we Every time we do a Skype show, it's like so many technical difficulties right at the beginning of the show, but I think I got this one dialed. If y'all can't hear him, say something in the comment section. But what's up, man? How you been? I've been good. been good getting out on the water. How about yourself? trying to get out on the water as much as I can. The, the trout bug has kind of died off for me. I was running on that train pretty hard for a little while and I just don't quite have the passion anymore. Cameron, you've been still fishing a good bit too, right? Yeah. Decent amount. I I feel like the, um, trout get really hard for me this time of year. Yeah. Um, you know, in the fall when they're, they kind of seem like they're everywhere and then it gets really cold and I, I'm just not very good at finding them this time of year. I need to fish with you more, I think. I, I don't know, man. I've been struggling, too. I'm on that, that uh, redfish game now. Yeah, I know. No. Some, They're starting some to dock school pounding. Up. But, um, but sweet, man. Well, me and Will, this is usually when we'll start fishing together is, is in February. Like, we'll both have some open days, and I'll be like, hey, man, let's meet at uh, – at X tomorrow morning at five o'clock and we'll, we'll both drive from separate locations and meet up and go shad fish or striper fish or something like that. But, um, but yeah, well, let's uh, tell, tell everyone how you kind of got into fishing, where that passion started. Yeah. So, you know, I've been fishing with my dad my whole life. Um, I mean, some of my earliest memories are just throwing bait off the pier, um, that kind of thing. And 
then in high school really got into uh, fishing, especially fly fishing. Um, and then I moved back up to Eastern North Carolina in Raleigh and uh, started fishing the Noose River a lot. And uh, that's really where it kind of took off for me. Moving water, fly fishing um, was, was just really stuck with me. Um, liked it a whole lot. Uh, and and that, everything was downhill from there. Uh, ended up out in Montana for a little bit. Um, and then, of course, now up in Alaska uh, doing the trout thing. Uh, but still, the thing that really gets me um, is the coastal river fishing here in eastern North Carolina, specifically what we're talking about, uh, the shad runs. Uh, they're just a super unique fishery. Uh, not a lot of places have them, uh, not in the quantities that we do. Um, and, and the rivers themselves are, are just awesome to be on, really small, fun water to fish. Right on. I was telling Cameron before the show, I was like, what's so cool about Will is like his passion for the fishery. It's like, you know, some guys, they want to be like the tarpon guide or they want to be like the, it's like this glory fishing. Like you want to be the guy that's posting like tarpon jumping out of the water. But like I, my favorite thing is someone who is like just super passionate about their fisheries and their resource. And that, that's definitely you. And you're very knowledgeable. I remember just talking to you at the times we fished and, and the stuff that, you know, and throw down, it's just real cool. And it's great for a client on the boat, you know, like when you have that knowledge, just about every little thing in that, that zone or that ecosystem, to be able to talk about, it just makes for a more, much more entertaining day. Oh, definitely. For definitely. sure. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about your, your Alaska season. So you've done a few seasons up there. Yeah. How long is your season and kind of tell us what you do up there, what lodge you work at and, and all that. Yeah, so I started working for Tick Chick Narrows Lodge. It was kind of my first real guide gig I got um, three seasons ago now. I'll be heading back up for my fourth season um, here in June. Um, so our season up there, it's uh, it's June through September. Um, we fish primarily for rainbow trout um, and all five salmon species, as well as Ar Arctic char, Dolly Varden. Um, we have a really, really incredible program up there. We operate four airplanes, uh, three de Havilland beavers, and we got a Cessna as well. So we're flying out every day. We have 14 uh, great fishing guides that I get to work with. Um, the staff is incredible. A bunch of great guys on board. Awesome to have been able to learn from them. Um, well, like I said, we're a daily fly out lodge. Us as guides, uh, we have the cool opportunity. We actually typically live on the rivers that we're fishing. So we get to know them really intimately. Um, what I do up there is, is trout fishing uh, for the most part. I do a little bit of salmon fishing here and there, but uh, for the most part doing trout fishing, uh, whether it's the streamer fishing in the beginning of the season on the fly rod or uh, doing the bead fishing behind the salmon beds uh, towards the end of the season. Um, and it's just, if you're into trout fishing, there's not a better place to be. Uh, big, wild Alaskan rainbow trout. It is, uh, it's truly hard to beat. Yeah, I miss, uh, I, I did a season up there in Alaska, and I, I love what I do now, but every summer, like the beginning of the summer, like when everyone's heading off to Alaska, I'm like, God, man, I wish I could still go up there. Like if I could find someone that would hire me for like, three weeks a summer, I, it'd be hard yeah. for me to say no to it. Like <laughs> if they pay, even if they just pay to fly me up there and pay, like pay all the expenses and I could just come up there for three weeks and guide, I would do it in a heartbeat. It's just, it's the, the wilderness up there, man. And it's not even the, the fishing is like icing on the cake. It's like getting in those, in those float planes and flying out and seeing everything that you're you're seeing is just, uh, it's really cool. I keep forgetting to change the camera. What's up guys. It's just, yeah, it's super, it's super, uh, it still didn't change. There we go. It's just a super cool place, man. Those float, I, I would go back just for the, the float pa plane, float plane flights. It's pretty incredible. Yeah. I've never been able to go out sure. there, but it, every picture I see, every story I hear, it just, it looks absolutely amazing. It's so cool, man. The, like uh, I love when the, the, the clouds are low and you're flying those float planes super low and, you can kind of see the mountains out in the distance sticking up into the clouds. It's just yeah. really cool. Hey, do you have any good, uh, being in Alaska, do you have any close bear encounters? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, we, we have our fair share. Um, have you been asked that question before? <laughs> just yeah, uh, pr pretty much on a regular basis. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think uh, so. my most memorable one uh, was actually – Gosh, there's been so many. Uh, the, the one that really sticks out is, uh, you know, we're out there camping in a, in a wall tent. Um, so you're really in the middle of nowhere, and it's just two guides out in the woods, um, really just fishing all day, coming back and falling asleep immediately. But <laughs> one night we were up hanging out, and uh, the guy that I was camping with at the time uh, decided to make a comment. He's like, you know, I haven't. I've been in Alaska for almost three years guiding now, and I haven't really seen 
any brown bears up here? You know, I'm starting to think they don't exist. And in the back of my mind, I was like, this is it. We're, we're going to start <laughs> seeing them all the time now. It jinxed us. And lo and behold, the next morning we wake up and uh, I walk out in the tent and uh, turn around the corner, kind of back towards the woods uh, to use our wonderful Tundra restroom facility. <laughs> and uh, I come about probably 20, 30 foot away from a bear that was about the size of a pickup truck cab. I mean, it was, oh, it was yeah. the most terrified I've ever been. Um, of course, my friend's still in the tent snoring. So I'm yelling at him to wake up. And thankfully when he starts running out, um, it kind of scares the bear away, bears away. Yeah. Uh, luckily up in Bristol Bay, these bears don't see a lot of people. So they're, they're pretty timid, but I'll tell you being close to an animal that large is, uh, Definitely a humbling experience. Yeah, that is that is a humbling experience for sure. I've got one bear story that I want to share from my time up there that, that's pretty crazy. I haven't shared this story. I haven't even thought about this story in a while. But so it was a weather day, and, and we weren't able to fly out because the, the clouds and everything were so low. So we, our lodge is on um, a river, and so we, we'll kind of just split the guides up on that river. And so on the river on, you can – from the lodge, there's like a three-mile run down, and then this big falls you can't run the boat through. So we, we keep boats at the bottom of it, and we – would run boats to the top and have to hike through. And so we're about probably a quarter of a mile up from, probably less than that, probably just, you know, a couple hundred yards up from the Portage Trail. I don't know why I'm losing my breath so bad <laughs> talking. <laughs> but a couple miles up from the Portage Trail, and uh, there's two cubs playing on the bank. And so the guys I have are big hunters, big fishermen, and they had a really nice camera. They're like, oh, let's, let's kind of set up and drift by and get some pictures of these cubs playing on the bank. And so the shelf coming off from the, from the dry land was probably, it's a wide river. It was probably 75 to a hundred yards of like a foot and a half of water. And so we're kind of floating in that. I trimmed the motor up so we don't bump the bottom and we're, we're floating through there and we're getting pictures of these, these little cubs playing. And right when we get out about in front of them, we're about a hundred yards away from them, like right on the edge of where it starts to get deep, but we're still sitting in the shallow water. Here comes mama. And they freak out and run back into the bushes. And the mom comes running out of the trees. I guess it was, I can't remember what kind of trees they were straight out to us, like lips peeled back teeth out and bluff charged us and stopped at like 20 yards. <laughs> As, and I was like, the guys were like hit the deck. They're laying down in the boat and I'm sitting there trying to drop the motor back in the water and get it cranked. <laughs> and then we have to freaking go and walk the portage trail down to the bottom section. We waited about 25 minutes and, and we're doing the old hay bear thing, but that was, <laughs> we were in the boat with the motor not running. And it, I mean, I've never been so scared. I'm surprised there wasn't crap in my waders and I was done with it, but <laughs> it was, uh, that was my scary. Other than that, like you're saying, they're, they're not like, that was because we startled the cubs, but they're not really that aggressive. Well, I mean, you know? I, I refer to them as salmon raccoons. Yeah, they are salmon raccoons. That's a good, yeah. that's a good phrase for them. But what, what, is, what's your favorite part about Alaska? My favorite part is, uh, I would have to say we do a couple small creek hike-ins uh, where you get to sight fish rainbows, um, and, and especially on mice patterns. Um, that is hard to beat. Small water, throwing a mouse and watching a big rainbow come up and inhale it. Um, you can't ask for anything yeah, better. That's, into that's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. So we have some questions coming in. Greg Barnes said, I'm thinking, I'm thinking about booking a hosted trip to, uh, with the Alaskan Bush Company. Any advice? <laughs> oh the alaskan bush company wait that's a strip club i just as soon as i read that out yeah. i remember that <laughs> I, I was about to say i don't i'm not aware of their hosted trip program <laughs> they've got guides from all around the, all around the world barely clothed that take you fishing <laughs> it's the big strip club that's in anchorage <laughs> i was like the alaskan bush that sounds familiar and then as soon as i read it i remembered exactly what it was that's the one that you were yeah for. i worked for the alaskan bush company <laughs> i made i made more money that summer than i ever did the rest of my life <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, so what, you, when you, what were you saying, Cameron? Well, I was gonna add, Will, Will, do you get to um, do much fishing on, on your own when you're out in Alaska, or are you pretty much guiding every day? Um, you know, I, I'm fortunate. Um, I get to fish as much as I want. You know, we have the great 20 hours of sunlight every day. Yeah. Uh, so quite a bit after I'm done with work, especially if it's a you know, more challenging day when I can't figure out the fish, I go out and, you know, we've been out in the river a, a couple times until 11, 12 o'clock at night, just fishing. Um, so yeah, I get, I get quite a bit of time that. to fish and then I get one day off a week. Um, and, and I usually spend that hiking up whatever Creek, um, is fishing well at that time and just taking a look around and trying to find some fish. So 
I'm, I'm fortunate in that aspect. I, I actually do get to throw the rod quite a bit up That's there. Cool. That's super cool. Out of all the, um, the species that are in those rivers, do you have a f- favorite one to catch? I would, you know, the Arctic char are probably my favorite. Oh, um, they're all colored up too, man. They're yeah, just gorgeous. Bright, bright orange, and they ha- they just fight so well. Um, pound for pound, they fight incredibly. Um, and like Judd said, the, you can't beat a bright orange fish like have that. You, have you ever seen a picture of those fish? I don't think so. They're like fluorescent orange and yellow. They're cra- When they're in spawning colors, they can be silver too, but uh-huh. they, they, they yeah. get really, really colored up. They're super cool. Honestly, man, one fish I miss a lot from Alaska, and people will be like, I think this is lame. Uh-huh. But the grayling, man. The grayling oh, were just so much. There, there didn't have to be a hatch for two years, and a grayling will come up and eat whatever dry fly you throw. You could really? throw like a massive caddis, and they'll just come up yeah. and sip it. And they'll just they eat I like anything. Gurglers. And do what? I like the gurglers for them. Yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll eat a gurgler. It's really <laughs> and cool. they're beautiful too, man. They're super fun. I remember – uh, the first, my first day up there, like we worked super long and like you're saying, like it's light uh, pretty much. You can fish 24 hours out of the day pretty much Yeah. Um, for, for part of that season. And we worked all day and like no one else wanted to fish. It was my first year guiding there. Everyone's like, oh, I don't want to go down there and catch grayling. And I walked down there by myself and like, they're like, just tie a caddis on. And I walked down there and it was like every freaking cast with a caddis, the grayling would come up and eat it just right off yeah. the freaking dock at the lodge, which was so cool. But uh, I don't know why I keep swinging my hand around. Like I got a fly rod in my hand. Y'all can't see me. But, uh, well, cool. So you, what, you're, that season wraps up when for you? So we wrap up uh, around mid-September. I'm usually back down in North Carolina uh, by September 20th or so. Right on, right on. Well, let's let's jump in and talk about what you do here in North Carolina. Um, yeah. Kind of go through the seasons and what you kind of target through those different seasons. And we're going to jump into the shad and the striper fishing. Um, but you've got a pretty cool operation out of Raleigh. Um, fishing yep. a lot of the coastal rivers and stuff and other bodies of water you got around there. So tell, let's tell people about that a little bit. Yeah. So, uh, like you were saying, I, I spend most of my time on the coastal river. So that's the tar, the Roanoke, the noose river and parts of the Cape fear river. Uh, now primarily I, I do spend most of my time on the tar river and the noose river. Um, so coming back from Alaska, um, you know, rolling into September, October, um, especially with the warmer, um, when it's a little bit warmer during that time of year, we have great largemouth bass fishing. Typically, our water's a little bit lower and more clear, so a lot of good sight fishing opportunities, uh, whether it be on topwater bugs, um, poppers, or even uh, smaller streamers. Um, moving into the winter, you know, we have uh, the largemouth bass fishing actually picks up, believe it or not, in the river system. Um, you get those fish schooled up, uh, you can throw crayfish patterns to them and, and have some pretty awesome days out there. Um, river conditions allowing, um, then moving into the, uh, you know, late winter, early spring, we're thinking about shad and striper. Uh, they're starting to move into the river systems. Uh, we see them as early as January and February. And then throughout the spring, it's just all targeting striper and, uh, shad. Shad will stick around until May. Striper will just get better and better. Um, and then by the time those, uh, fisheries are starting to taper off, I'm thinking about headed back North and, uh, getting back up after some rainbow trout. Right on. It's a, it's a solid fun year right there. T- tell me a little bit about, or let's talk a lot about the, the whole habit of, or the life of a, of a shad, um, and explain to people kind of where they go and when they come back and just that, that whole kind of life cycle. Yeah. So shad are really cool. Um, they're a pelagic species most of the year, you know, they're offshore, quite a ways, schooled up um, by the hundreds of thousands. Um, and, and come springtime, they all start moving into the rivers to spawn. Um, now, that happens at various points, uh, depending on where you are on the East Coast. Uh, you know, I have friends down in Jacksonville that are already starting to get into some, Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and, and as time progresses, they, you know, they start getting their run in December, January. And as time progresses, we'll start seeing them in uh, more northern rivers. And North Carolina here, um, we see them typically around February, um, and we have two. We actually have two species of shad um, that come up the rivers. We have the hickory shad and the American shad. Um, the American shad tend to be a little bit bigger. Um, all, they're also called white shad um, a lot of places in eastern North Carolina, um, and the hickory shad tend to be just a little bit smaller. They can be a little difficult to tell apart. Um, you tend to find hickory shad in a little bit more numbers. Um, the American shad are a little bit fewer and far between. But like I said, they do get a little bit larger. So there's fish moving to the river. Um, when, typically when the water temperatures are around 
52 to 54 degrees, it, it really depends. Um, and they have a, a good flow coming out of whatever dam um, is releasing. Uh, that, that's a big part of it is water levels. Um, and that plays into our fishing throughout the year quite a bit. Uh, and those fish will move up river uh, typically to their ancestral spawning grounds if they have the water to reach it, just like a salmon does. Um, and they will spawn there. And that typically occurs 62 degree water um, for most fish. Uh, there's obviously, you know, a little bit of discrepancies among populations. Uh, and after those fish spawn, a lot of them will actually turn around and go back to the ocean. Um, so that's what's really unique about these fish is they can come back for multiple spawning runs throughout their life. Um, and these fish are coming up in pretty large numbers. Uh, it, it is a pretty cool migration. It's very similar to salmon spawning. Um, but it, those fish do actually return opposed to salmon. They die. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's uh, that's kind of a sad, sad end of the story, but, um, all right. So when you say these fish spawn, are the shad going to hang around very long after they spawn? Or are they spawning and, and getting the heck out? You know, there's a, there's a little bit of debate to that question. Um, they do hang around for at least a while, at least a couple days. Okay. Um, some might stay in the river a little bit longer. I've, I've caught a few of them just mostly by accident in June that were hanging out for whatever reason. Uh, but typically those fish are going to turn around within the next couple days after spawning and get out and get yeah. there. Yeah. And, and then those juvenile fish, um, will hang out in the river for usually an entire year before they head back to the ocean to join the school. So if people, mm -hmm. if people want to, go and say you know they've got some a river near their house or, or they're they want to go shad fishing north carolina what are what are the rivers that are worth shad fishing that ha that hold a decent population of fish in north carolina luckily all four of our rivers all four of our major coastal rivers have great populations of shad um you know american shad are going to be a lot more prevalent in the tar and the cape fear river uh, while you're going to have majority hickory and the roanoke and the tar river or in the roanoke and the noose river um all of them will, will hold shad um, and, and hold enough numbers to make it, you know, worth your while going out. Um, that's the really cool thing about this migration is it's super easy to fish and super accessible for anyone that wants to fish it. Yeah, for sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about like what you look for on the river as far as where to fish for these shad. Because we were talking about it before the show and, you know, you can be, there could be 20 boats around you sometimes shad fishing and two boats are catching them every cast and other guys are, you know, aren't catching a single fish all day. What, what do you want to find in a river? Like what tells you, Oh, there should be shad here. And like, how long are you going to pick a spot apart before you maybe go somewhere else to, to try? Yeah. So that's a great question. Um, the easiest thing you can find anywhere is a tributary coming into the river. Um, whether it's a Creek or a gut, um, whatever it may be, that's always a good place to start. Um, the current seams, on that uh, with that confluence will typically hold fish um normally a popular the larger the the river coming in or the creek coming in uh there will typically be a portion of that population that will run up that creek to spawn as well um so it's a safe bet to start there um the other places to look i, I mean it's pretty simple any current break uh these fish are going to be all over the place look for any any type of lay down where these fish can get out of the current you know they have a they have a long journey to make. So they're trying to get out of the current typically during the day, staying down a little bit deeper and then moving more so during the night. So I look for any kind of current break, any kind of, uh, Creek or gut coming into the river. Uh, those are the two kind of structures I look for the most. Um, now these, the important thing to remember about shad when you're fishing for them, uh, like we were talking about before the show is they typically school up single file, um, so that means you, you want to spend a good amount of time picking apart a spot before you just go on and move. Uh, these fish typically aren't going to move far for a lure or a fly. Um, they're not actively feeding. It's more of an aggression strike. So you want to spend a good amount of time at any given spot and picking, pick it apart. Um, see if you can find something, try a couple colors, uh, Colors are huge with shad fishing. I don't know what it is. They can be so selective about what color lure you're putting in front of them. Um, so I typically, if I if I pull up on a spot where I traditionally know there's going to be fish, um, I have a sequence of rigs and colors that I go through. 
Um, and we make sure we pick apart every section of that water where it could hold fish with every color. And if we don't find fish, we, we go ahead and move. Um, it doesn't take a long time. You just need to be thorough with it. Um, and if you don't find fish there or those fish aren't willing, go into the next spot and do the same thing. You just have to have a, a you know, a standardized approach to these fish is always, is always helpful. Um, and it'll, it'll help you find a few more fish, you know, going through a couple different colors. And I kind of have the same, um, the same system I do every time going through a couple different colors, a couple different styles of bait and really picking apart that water, um, it, it is the key to finding those fish. Sweet. Will, would you say that, um, shad when you're looking for spots to fish is it similar to what you would look for like if you're speckled trout fishing yeah it, it could be similar um it, it would be, yeah that would that would be a good comparison um holding water and, and current breaks and yeah, seams mo- moving water moving water is the big thing those fish are looking for moving water any type of you know seam or eddy that that is really what you're looking for they want to be able to get back into that current because that's where they're going to be traveling um like i said but they're during the day they're typically going to try and find some refuge from that current Mm -hmm. in one form or another whether it's a big rock a big log in the river or whether it's that seam that's created when you have that creek come in. Yeah. Um, th- just anywhere where they can be close to the main current, but can still get out of it and rest for a while. Oh, so what are, the, uh, what, are, what are shad feeding on mostly? So most of these shad are filter feeders. They do eat um, small fish eggs and small fish as well. Um, but typically these shad aren't actively feeding during their migration. Um, they're they're hitting like a lot of salmon do just solely out of aggression um i i wish i could tell you why i'll let you know whenever i figure it out (laughs) so when you're um when you're out there fishing what do you what are you using for lures yeah so again with shad fishing super super uh simple um you don't don't need to go buy a bunch of fancy tackle for this i usually if i'm spin fishing i'm using a seven foot light action spinning rod um 10 pound test braid and typically I go to a 12 pound test leader. Uh, I I use fluorocarbon most of the time for the abrasion resistance. Now this is probably a little bit heavier than a lot of other folks use. Um, But when you're shad fishing, given the structure of these coastal rivers, you're going to get hung up in stuff. Um, Which brings me to the the next uh, piece of tackle that we're using, which is really cheap jig heads. Like (laughs) one um, one thirty second ounce or one sixteen ounce jig heads. Uh, the cheaper, the better, because if you do get hung up, you want those hooks to pull out so you can get your rig back. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Real flimsy was, hooks. You can, you can bend out, bend back in. Yeah. And these fish have small, soft mouths. So you don't have to worry too much about breaking a hook on a fish yeah. or anything like yeah. that. Um, so typically, a, a one thirty second ounce jig head, uh, rig to a two inch curly tail grub, um, in a variety of colors is my go-to uh, rig that has caught me more shad than anything else. Uh, I also like the two inch tube jigs, uh, work out well. Um, and then another really popular lure is just a shad dart, um, which I like just tying them at home, a little bit of bucktail on jig head, nothing too complicated. Uh, like I said, the simplicity of shad fishing, it's, it's really wonderful. It uh, and the other thing you'll see a lot is a, is running a spoon, um, on a, on a two lure rig where you'll have a spoon in front and then 16 inches behind, you'll be running your curly tail. Uh, that helps get the, the lure down a little bit more in the current. Um, so that's another rig we use, but personally I, I I'm a big fan of the single curly tail or the, the double curly tail rig. Um, it's typically what I'm going with. We had Greg Barnes right in the same one that talked about the Alaskan bush company. And he was saying, what, <laughs> what colors do you use on your shad flies? So yeah, shad flies, um, my go-to color is red and white. Um, I, I very rarely stray from that red and white or red and white or pink and white, um, are typically what I'll throw, uh, every once in a while you want, you want to have a lot of colors in your box just in case. Um, like I said, these fish just have this weird tendency to get picky about their colors. Um, and I, I like brighter colors. So I, I stick with the red and white. I go to the pink and white a lot. Chartreuse and white is good. Um, you're probably noticing a trend. They're always as white in the fly. Um, <laughs> is, is just something that I like to do. It seemed to be very effective for me. Um, but a little red and white, uh, just marabou, some chenille, and lead eyes, 
you really don't need anything else. Sweet. Typically, if you're getting that fly down deep enough, um, it, and they're there, they'll typically hit it. Do you usually use a sinking line when you're hunting or yeah. when you're fishing yeah. for shad? Yep. So for the fly rods, I'll run a nine foot six weight, uh, fly rod with a 150 grain, uh, 25 or 30 foot sinking line. Sweet. Um, yeah, that's the that's kind of my go-to rig for them, and then just straight twelve-pound test for your tippet, and that's all you need. When you're, um, I guess we, when you, when you're working a when you're working a fly, is there a certain way that you like to strip it? Is it just long, slow strips or quick strips? Little variation. Yeah, so definitely one of those things, and and just with the spin rod as well, um, is the same way. You want to. They're going to want it differently in any given day. Uh, mm -hmm. With the fly rod, the first approach that I use to kind of search for fish in a run is I just swing the fly, a classic wet fly swing. So you're going to cast that fly 45 degrees downstream, um, and then you're going to follow that fly line as the fly tracks through the water. Mm -hmm. That's a really easy way to locate fish because you give a wide presentation to that, uh, that school of fish down there. Mm -hmm. um, now, as the fish get more aggressive, um, typically that is when light conditions drop and you have an overcast day. Um, we do add some long, slow strips or some very short tick strips with long pauses in between. Um, that those are, those are the majority of what we'll do with the fly rod, but typically those fish are, are really, um, keen to hit on the swing with the fly rod. Um, the spinning rod is the same, really the same game. You can swing those lures through just as you would a fly rod and jig them kind of as you would trout fishing. Um, but really the easiest way to do it, I'll tell you the truth is throw that lure out there, keep your rod tip relatively low and just reel very slowly. Yep. That's, and, that's been my favorite way to trout fish this year too. As the season ends, like just a, the littlest amount of application, the better, you know? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. And it's easy, especially for clients on the boat. Um, one of the things I love about shad fishing, um, it's great for getting younger clients that have never have never been fishing or have never been fly fishing. It's a it's a super easy fish to catch. The techniques are not very difficult. Right on. Cool. We got a couple questions coming in here. One is uh, from William Barber. Any crystal flash on the flies? Yeah, um, I, I make sure I have both um, uh, flies with and without flash. Um, there are times where I do feel like those fish shy away from the flash. Um, typically when you look at shad fly patterns around the internet or, or anywhere, they're going to be ultra flashy with as many bright colors as, uh, you can possibly throw in there. Uh, I did that for a while. And then I started looking at our curly tail grubs that we were fishing and there's not an ounce of flash in there and they outfished us every day. Um, yeah. so we, act, I, I actually typically throw flies without flash first, um, and, and tend to do better on those. Right on. Well, um, we just had another comment come in from Caleb Hofer. He said, "Will Paul fishes Tenkara. Do you have a comment um, against that? I I, I don't. I don't <laughs> have a Tenkara rod. <laughs> he also just said, "Are shad fish big? So, some shad fish are big. You know, <laughs> your 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 average size hickory shad is going to be about half a pound to a pound. Um, your American shad are going to be a little bit bigger. They can get up." I think our, our state record shad actually from the Tar River was getting close to seven pounds, if I remember correctly. So Whoa. you can get some some really large fish. Yeah, um, on a light action rod and heavy current, that would be quite the uh, quite the fun battle. Yeah, those shad do fight hard, especially pound for pound. They are they are very hard to beat. So Chase Robinson just said, do you target them in the lower sections of the river near the sound, or are you focusing your efforts mostly further upriver? So I, I fish the entire river. Um, I, I follow them up as they come up. Uh, a lot of fish, I, I do spend most of my time targeting the upper river. I found a lot of those fish beeline straight up river to the spawning grounds here in February. Um, so I, I, I typically like to stay up, up river, less people. Um, that being said, the boating's a good bit more difficult. Um, but there are plenty of fish down river and there's plenty of fish that spawn in some of those tributaries as well that I'll go and fish, especially if we get blown out really bad up river yeah for sure well th th that brings up a good point let's talk a little bit about the boat you're running that allows you to fish these fish the whole way up the river yeah so i'm running a uh, i've been running for about a year now year this season a towy calusa which is uh it's a technical skiff uh 
I refer to it as the GNU with leather interior. Um, <laughs> it's it's a little bit nicer GNU essentially with higher sides, so it's a good bit more a little stable. bit wider too than most GNUs, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, the beam on it's a uh, fifty eight, I believe. Yeah, it's still, it's still a small boat. Um, gets really skinny and it, it, the tar being what it is, um, which can be a difficult river to run where lots of trees, lots of, uh, sandbars. Um, it's, it's helpful to have a smaller profile boat to get in and out of a lot of those spots. Well, sweet. We got some more questions here. Uh, Cameron Metcalf said, if it weren't for dams and locks, how far, um, do they, do you think these fish traditionally migrated to spawn inland? Um, I, I guarantee these fish go as far as they possibly could. Now, a lot of places where you do have these dams, um, like, say, Weldon, for instance, um, I imagine – I'm not exactly sure what that looked like before the dam, but I imagine they were probably still spawning there yeah. uh, beforehand. Um, same same deal with the Noose River. Um, I get that question a lot, especially with the dam removal there. Uh, I found on that river, most of those fish are still spawning around the Goldsboro area, uh, regardless of that dam removal. There's not a huge population that's making it up river. Gotcha. Uh, but, uh, you know, on rivers like the Cape Fear, I think it probably makes a pretty, pretty big difference. Mm-hmm. Those, um, I think the largest, the longest migration for American shad is, um, I want to say around 400 miles. So they'll, oh, they'll go boy. quite a ways. Golly, that's crazy. So yeah. what are they looking for to spawn? Are they do they want like a nice gravelly substrate like a salmon or trout does? Or um, the substrate's not quite as important. It is a moderate water flow, um, typically in shallower water around two feet, um, and they actually spawn in the middle of the river and they do it at night. It's it's a little funky. Um, it looks, it's just, yeah, <laughs> specifically the Americans I'm talking about right now. I should say. Mm-hmm. Um, their spawning hab- habits are a little bit more well observed. Um, so they're spawning in the middle of the river. They're they're looking for a sandy substrate, sandy gravelly substrate, just like any other fish. Um, but it, they're not nearly as picky as you know, like a salmon would be um, about their spawning substrate. Right on. Um, well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the the striper fish. Is there anything else shad fishing wise that we can touch on? Oh, conditions wise, you touched on that a little bit, but like what's, what's primo conditions, shad fishing? Let's talk water flow and like weather yeah. conditions. Yeah. So water flow is a big, is a big deal. Um, especially in Eastern North Carolina where we have really volatile flows. You got to be checking them every time before you're going out. Um, where can people check those flows if they want to um, look into it? I believe USGS, um, it, Google is your best friend in this case. Um, if you Google your you know, Tar River flows at Rocky Mount, or if you Google Noose River flows, um, it falls the noose. Those will give you the the flows out of the dam, um, and then it will give you the gauges downstream as well. Gotcha. Uh, Pretty easy to find. Um, So what I look for, you want higher than average water um, to bring them up is always good. But when you really want to get targeted on those fish is going to be when that water starts to drop. Um, Fish the drop is what I say. Uh, that drop and flow tends to be your best fishing. Um, the other thing that you're looking for too is if it if it gets too low, don't even don't even bother with them. A lot of them will stay will just stage down where they are and won't um, won't move up. Uh, now weather conditions wise, um, it, it's hard to say. I've had bang up days in the sun, uh, and you know, bright, sunny, hot days. And, uh, I've had great days when it's cold and raining. Uh, that being said, as far as fish aggressively eating your lure, I have found that the darker days, you know, a light rain overcast, uh, things like that, still a mild temperature. You don't want it to be too cold. Um, that typically is the ideal setting you're looking for. Right on. And what's a, what's like a bang up day shad fishing like? I would say anything anything over a hundred fish a day, um, and, and I say a hundred fish in you know four to six hours um, is a is a pretty good day shad fishing. Cool. Um, you can definitely see two hundred fish days are, are not out of the question by any means. Yeah, those days are crazy. If you have a if you if you're guiding or fishing full time for shad, like shad fishing. And you've got a cut on your hand. It's probably not going to heal during uh, <laughs> nope. during, during shad season. <laughs> a lot of wet, slimy fish hands. Well, that's cool. I, I'm yeah. so excited. This is getting me fired up to shad fish. It's like it sneaks up on me every year. Like, and then I'm like, oh man, I got to go shad fish. And then I get hooked on it. I'll go for like three, three or four weeks straight. 
whenever I've got a free day driving and chat fishing. But uh, well, cool. Yep. Well, let's talk a little bit about uh, the striper fishing in the coastal rivers. And, and the main focus I wanted to be the shad fishing um, for people that, that might want to go out there and give it a shot or that might already be giving it a shot. But let's talk about the striper fishing too. Um, can you find striper in all the coastal rivers in North Carolina as well? You can, yeah. Um, the Noose, the Tar, the Roanoke, and the Cape Fear um, all have their populations of striper, and they're all very different from what I've found. Um, you got to target them in different ways, fish for them at different times of the year. Their spawning migrations are all definitely a little bit, a little bit different. Um, so, you know, the Roanoke is very well known for it. Uh, awesome migration. Um, April, May, some of the best fishing on the East Coast, hands down. Um, just absolutely incredible fishing. Uh, whether it's on the fly rod or the spin rod, it's it's great. Um, I, I really like fishing the Tar River as well. Um, those, there's there's some fish, and, and this is th- true throughout all the coastal rivers. Um, there are resident fish around, and there are migratory fish around. Um I found the tar resident fish typically stick around a little bit later um, than some of the other coastal rivers. And it can be a a really fun fish to target, um, especially in that it's much smaller water than the Roanoke um, and a little bit more advantageous for guys looking to throw the fly rod and try and hunt for a little bit bigger of a fish. Um, But yeah, you can find them in all of them. I don't do a whole lot of striper fishing on the Noose River. Um, I've seen a couple good fish, um, up towards the Raleigh area. They're definitely around, but it's few and far between up that way. Um, from my experiences. Yeah. yeah the Cape Fear river, we don't really have much of a migration of fish anymore. Or we don't have any of them, any migration of yeah, fish anymore. Pretty much are just all yeah. stocked. Yeah. All stocked fish. Someone told me this the other day. Um, and maybe Jot said it when he was on the show. You can tell if a striper is stocked or not, if the lines on it are broken or not or the, that'd be like the purity of the the strain yeah correct? Is of, that... the, of the strain i think and i i could be wrong i am by no means a fisheries biologist um but i think that it has to do with the, the purity of the genetics i know they do hybridize with with white bass i'm not right. sure if they do in our coastal rivers too much um but i do see like on the noose i've seen a lot of fish with broken lines um, you don't see it very often at all, um, on the Roanoke or the tar from my experience. Yeah, I'd agree. I'm, at least on the Roanoke. I was, yeah. Saying, last year was the first time I ever fished the Roanoke and it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, it was like, unlike anything I've ever seen. Um, but those, so those fish come up to spawn and then they ca- and then they come back out. Are they going out into the Pamlico or are they, yeah. do they just stay there all all year until it's spawning time again, and then they come back up to Roanoke. You want to take that one? Um, yeah. So they do um, in the Albemarle. Um, they they do stay down there, um, and there's a great winter fishery for them going on right now. There's a lot of guys down there already getting into quite a few fish. I imagine those fish stay in the sound for most of the summer, and and a, a portion of them, of course, probably go out with that northern migratory stock that goes all up and down the east coast. Mm-hmm. Um, I found a lot of our tar river fish. I think most of them stay in the Pamlico, um, if not in the river itself. Um, I think during the summer when it gets really hot, they're probably migrating more towards the salt, but we see them in the fall and the winter, um, in places that, you know, you just wouldn't always expect them to be. Yeah. A lot of the, I think a lot of those fish are staying in the curve talk out of the Roanoke. And like you're saying, you'll see guys all summer catching fish up there while they're trout fishing and, hmm. and whatnot. Same with the tar with the Pamlico and, Oh yeah, but, but yeah, I think a lot of those fish too, and I don't know. I'm not a, a, a fish biologist either, but I think some of them have to be going out in the ocean, migrating north as well. Um, you know, like tradition traditionally fish would do. Do they d- tend to do that like redfish when they get a lot bigger? Yeah, from what from what I understand, um, that it, they, they share that trait. Um, you have the larger fish moving out um, into the Atlantic uh, to go with that migratory stock and. Um, you know, a lot of those large fish that you see caught up north, um, a, a good bit of those are probably spawning down in the Roanoke mm-hmm. as well. That that whole stock moves up and down the East Coast. Yeah, I remember seeing a picture um, from a guy named Matt Lusk. Yeah. Who was f- trout fishing off the beach in the Outer Banks with, like, who knows what type of bound line he was using, probably 10 or 15. Yeah. And it caught, like, a 
40 inch striper that's awesome um, i haven't seen that picture which i think is i think it was like a fairly big deal because i don't think they they've done that in a while yeah they've they've i think it what did they overfish the herring population will and, yeah. and the, those fish aren't really coming down here anymore from what i understand it's a lot due to the herring population um grant i think ours is coming back a little bit from what i understand um and there used to be a big group of folks, I believe, in the 90s that would target them off the beaches in the Outer Banks and, and would get into some large fish, some really large fish. Yeah, I've seen uh, pictures uh, up there in the Outer Banks of, like, truck beds, like, overflowing with 30-pound, 40-pound striper. Wow. Like, w- when there was no regulation on them and you could go up there and catch them from the surf and keep them. Yeah, yeah I think, uh, I mean, as crazy as the migration is now, I think it was probably a little bit more wild back oh, yeah. in the day. I, that would be awesome to catch big striper. I mean, I know they still do it up north, but it, like, I would have loved to be yeah. surf fishing on the Outer yeah. Banks back in the days when you could have caught them like that. Yeah, I'm that. pretty sure if you go to, I don't remember what town it is on the Outer Banks, but it's one of the towns that has a, a big pier. And when you walk into the pier, there's Is it like, Avon? Yeah, it might be Avon. might be Avon. There's, um, I mean, there's all these pictures from back like, I don't know, 50 years ago. Uh-huh. With like people holding up like massive stripers that yeah. they caught right off the pier. I know it's crazy. It's so sad. I mean, that's just a, a story of what we're doing all up and down the coast, as far as and that's a whole. I say this every episode because we get into like <laughs> conservation talk, but I mean, we need to bring on someone to represent each fishery and just like hash out a, a, a conservation and, and fishery management plan. But not that it would do anything, but uh, it's what? it's crazy, man. Like we've <laughs> we've ruined so many great fisheries, and this, our striper fishery that we had is definitely one of them. Uh, a buddy that we brought on the show, Elias, he's a he's a YouTuber, a kayak YouTuber, and he he was telling me I didn't even know this about our fishery, but the Cape Fear was like the fourth best striper migration striper run in in the country uh, back in like the '60s or the '40s or something like that. Yeah, it rivaled Weldon from what I understand um, back in the day. Wow. Um, but, you know, Weldon's just a great testament. They That fishery was dead for a while, um, and, and now it is – I think I, I know both of us can uh, say it's it's quite healthy now. That's healthy. It's a good it's a good start to the guide season to go up there and just be able to bang out some 60, <laughs> 70, 80 fish days. <laughs> oh god, yeah, it's it's hard to beat. But Those just are, like that place can can give it to you, it can freaking kick your butt too. Like the days that they don't want to eat, you'll be marking them, and there'll be thousands yeah. of fish, oh, yeah, yeah, and, yes. and you can't oh, even yeah. get them. You'll feel your line ticking through them, and then all of a yeah. sudden you'll think you'll have one, but you just have them snagged in the belly. They can turn off. Yeah. And you're with, uh, you're with all your best friends out there too. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Nothing's, nothing's a secret when you're fishing out there. I know. Yeah, it I is mean, painful though when somebody's whacking them yeah, and you're not. Yeah. yeah. I, <laughs> yeah. The first time That's I went there, true. I was with you and we were in separate boats, but uh, you were talking to someone that was coming back up and he was like, dude, there is thousands of them down there that I'm marking, but they will not eat anything. Yeah. And so we went down there and it was raining and I was getting all frustrated because you could see them on your depth finder and and they would come up and you would, they would be like rolling all over oh, each yeah. other. Um, and I, and I remember thinking like, Oh my God, there's fish everywhere and I'm not going to catch a single <laughs> one. And then we ended up going further up and it, it turned out to be a great day, but yeah, it, it, can, can, de- it can definitely kick you a little bit. It really can and up there. I'd say, man, the overcast weather, a little drizzle, Mm-hmm. And a spe- is it up there? I can't even remember. Is it when they're dropping the water or when they're rising the water that's better for the striper? Um, you know, my best days this year were definitely when they were running high, you know, running like 16,000 out of there. Um, and when they cut that water off, my, my fishing definitely um, took a toll. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's like I, when you get a little bump, if they'll start yeah. to release a little bit more water or something like that, they're expecting some rain. That's when they fire off. I can yeah, I mean, <laughs> my best day last year, we didn't get a whole lot of rain. My best day last year was like the one day it rained at the end of April. Um, and it was just lights out. You, it, it was ridiculous. The water was boiling everywhere. You know how it gets up there. Oh, yeah. And when they'll eat a top water, do you have much good top water action on, on the Roanoke this year? Just those two days we had, I mean, they would eat anything you put in the water, um, uh, but really only those two days um, were really the only good topwater days. We had some eats. Um, we found some fish that were willing, but n- nothing nothing crazy. Um, that being said, those two days, I think we put something like 300 fish in the boat. I mean, you know, just ridiculous. Billy Hammock just mentioned, he said, steady water level is what you want. I'd agree. I, I think they like that steady water. Yeah. But I got to say, man, when they bump that, that water flow up just a little bit, man, they freaking fire off. 
It's fun. I say freaking yeah. a lot when I'm on this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, I, that's another testament to your boat, man. Because some of the places last year that you were taking that boat and, and catching them when other people weren't, I, I think another part of it too, like when it would get later in the day and you could tuck that boat way up in a little tight creek or something and fish a jig yeah. in, in some shaded water as opposed to being out in the sun, like the, you would you would definitely pull on some fish uh, a little bit longer. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I like getting up in that smaller stuff there, get away from everyone, kind of have it yourself. And, uh, as you know, I, I always am into throwing the fly rod and it's a lot easier to do it up river there, um, than it is down river. I don't like dredging those big, heavy sinking lines. They're just too hard to cast too much work. Um, but you know, you get up a little bit higher, you can throw a lighter, lighter fly line, um, make it a little bit easier and, reasonable casting distances and really get to some fish yeah for sure um I, i'd say wouldn't you say probably the first two and a half hours of the day are the best and the last two and a half hours a day really the first 45 minutes yeah. and last 45 minutes oh people want to book oh. full day trips up there and you're like let's just you know we can fish eight hours but let's fish the four in the morning and the four in the evening mm. take a little yeah, little yeah i i won't even do a full day up there i, I do mornings and afternoons for that exact reason uh, i think most guys most guys do that yeah. too. Yeah. Um, that being said, you know, I, I had some great afternoons. It's just, you know, you're looking for consistency and the consistency is in the mornings and the evenings for sure. I, I would agree. Um, so let's talk a little, we're almost to an hour, but tell people what you like to throw for the striper a little bit and the retrieve that you like to, to do when, when targeting the striper. Yeah. So, um, for the, for the spinning rod, a jig with the fluke, Chartreuse or white, nothing too crazy. I usually go with a three eighth ounce jig head and uh, throw it upstream, jig it back towards you. Nothing too complicated. Um, now with the fly rod, I, I typically am throwing an intermediate or a full sinking line around 300 grains or so um, on an eight or a nine weight fly rod. Um, and then I, I like throwing bigger flies out there, um, try and get some of those bigger fish. Uh, but it's hard to beat a Clouser minnow. Um, you know, size two Clouser minnow is pretty much your best bet if you want to get into fish. Yeah. Um, that being said, I do like throwing some of those bigger flies, whether it's the, uh, you know, double deceivers, uh, some of the game changer patterns. Uh, those can be really fun. And um, we were we were lucky enough up river, you know, throwing those. Um, on the intermediate lines, getting them maybe, you know, maybe a foot underneath the water just where you can still see them and uh, watching those fish come to eat them is, is pretty cool to see. Yeah, it's that's really super cool. cool. That's a painful fly to lose, though, a game changer. <laughs> and there's a lot yeah. of chance to lose it up there. But when you, you know, tie as many flies as you do and, and you're as good of a fly tire, it's not a big deal. If I sat there and took the four hours it would take me to tie a game changer – and then went and threw it and broke it off on a tree, probably in my back cast. It would never even touch the water. <laughs> I'd be pretty pissed. We lost one game changer all last year for as much as we threw them. Dude, um, you better knock on some wood. You're going to lose some this I, year. You no, know, I think it's um, – I think the trick is not going with those super heavy lines. Yeah, for sure. Um, you don't want to be dredging the bottom with a game changer. Fishing no, those fish are a little higher up in the water column. Yeah, and, and I've noticed, and I'm not sure if you've seen the same thing um, – when those fish eat my eat the jig, um, they're not eating it down very deep. Um, I started noticing I was watching those fish feed relatively high within the first four feet of the water column, um, and that's when I stopped using the the full sink lines and and went to more of the intermediate or sink tip line, um, and it performed just as well. It surely saved your shoulder from throwing it all day. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you definitely lost a whole lot less flies. Um, and you get that visual aspect of the eat too, which is, um, you know, if you're throwing a fly rod, you really shouldn't be concerned about numbers because you've already taken the handicap at this point. Um, <laughs> I, I like going for, you know, the cool visual eats, you know, trying to select for some of those larger fish if you can. Um, and yeah, you know, making it as easy as, and as fun as possible, really. For sure. Billy, Billy Hammock has another comment. Three-eighth ounce jig with a super fluke. Color does not matter as long as it's chartreuse or white. And that is, that's pretty true. Pink sometimes, <laughs> but usually chartreuse or white. I mean, there's a, there's a drug store up there. I can't remember what it's called. And we heard they had tackle. This was years ago. And went in oh, there. And they yeah. have these. You know what I'm talking about? I, I got the bag. You right got it right here. there. The mega bags, <laughs> yeah. man. What, the, the, what, how much, it was so cheap for those bags. You get like 250 wow. saw plastics. I shouldn't tell everyone my secret where to go buy those things, but 
Yeah, it's like a hundred for it's a hundred soft plastics for like seventeen dollars. Yeah, it's, it's such a good deal. Yeah. It's ridiculous. They're awesome. <laughs> you go buy uh, the usually I would go buy you know like twenty five packs of soft plastics and you're spending like a hundred bucks and you go up there and I did that one season and my buddy's like, well, let's go check this place out. I've heard they've got some tackle in there and they had all these big bags of just the soft plastics. That's awesome. I guess somebody around there makes them. They've got the molds or something and they're pouring them and making them. They must, um, but it is the, it is the best deal in town. And usually, by the time you get to the you know the second week of May, every guy is throwing them because they run out of all the tackle they've brought right. with them. Exactly. Hey, Will. One thing I, that I didn't even realize, just coming from someone who fishes mostly in the uh, in the marsh, um, and then Judd telling me, make sure you bring a uh, a river anchor. I was like, okay. And I realized how important it was, but in, in, in a lot of the areas you're fishing for shad and, or, or for stripers, is a river anchor pretty, um, necessary? Yeah. Yeah. You, you def, you definitely need to have a good anchor system. Um, that's, that's definitely one of the big advantages of running the towy is it's integrated anchor system makes your life a whole lot easier when you're constantly using it. You know, you're not pulling it out of the hatch you know, getting it set, getting it on the cleat, um, having a, a dedicated system helps, but you definitely want to have an anchor with you. Um, luckily with our sandy bottoms, you don't need anything too intense. Um, I, I run a pyramid anchor personally, cause I, I like to make sure we get, uh, we get stuck. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, your regular Bass Pro Shop river anchor does just fine, but I, I definitely recommend having one if you're planning to go shad fishing. Yeah. The, that 30 pound mushroom with a I would I don't know what you call it. I've got both. I've got the full mushroom, but then the ones with like the little separations in it, the little V's, yeah. the little wedges. Yeah, that that seems to be my favorite. Thirty yeah. pounds in that, and you will. I've cut some off up there in Weldon. Like I've definitely lost them. I always come up there each season with two or three of them. But um, yeah, those little wedges will definitely hang the bottom better. But you will sometimes get it just around a tree the right way and not be able to get it back. Um, yeah, be prepared to lose them. <laughs> yeah, be prepared to lose them. For, don't use nice anchor rope either. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go get some old uh, tube, uh, some tubing or, or ski rope or something like that, and use that. Um, that brings me to one more question we had on here. Um, do y'all like to anchor up when you're? Up? I might have just lost audio. Can you hear me? There we go. Oh, Came there back. Goes. Um, do y'all like to uh, do y'all like to anchor up when you're throwing artificials for striper and weld, or do y'all drift? Um, artificials personally, as long as I, if I'm fishing a jig, I like to anchor up. Um, I, I prefer to anchor up anything else. If I'm throwing a jerk bait or if I'm throwing a top water plug, um, or if I'm throwing the fly rod, I would much rather be drifting. Yeah, yeah. I'd agree. Yeah. That the jig is so heavy when you start, when you start drifting, casting and jigging, a lot of times you'll snag up, but if you can just yeah. fish it below you and kind of bounce on the bottom when those fish are deep, that's, mm -hmm. that's what I'll do. But I'm with you. Or, or like some people run a trolling motor. Sometimes I'll run a trolling motor if the, if I'm in less current and, and kind of yeah. like slow drift where you're, it's almost like you're slow dragging an anchor or something like that. Mm -hmm. And you can, you can do that. But yeah, there, there's great. I mean, each different way presents a different way to fish. You know, there's, there's, you can be effective anchoring and you can be effective, uh, um, drifting, but, but there's, there's some different aspects to each one i'm struggling with my words tonight <laughs> i'm so out of breath too it's crazy yeah that's really where the the rowing frame and the oars on the towy come into play at weldon um drifting with a fly rod so much more effective at setting the depth of your fly yeah mm -hmm. uh, and allows you to not have to use that ridiculously heavy sinking line um and if you're fishing above the boat ramp um you know, you're playing with fire, putting down a trolling motor anywhere. Oh yeah, it's you are. Uh, it's a dangerous game. <laughs> you're playing so with the fire, or, putting down a motor anywhere too. <laughs> yeah, the the oars are very helpful um, up there uh, for that specific kind of fishing. You know, going high upstream into the braids and fishing a fly rod, it's hard to beat. You know, western drift boat style fishing. Yeah, I know. I'm always so jealous of you and our buddy John Smolko up there with with. Uh, he has a jet boat. Right? He's got a jet boat, and and he's got oars as well. And just being able to fish in that style is is real effective. It really is. Yeah. So and some yeah, people get... look at you like, why is that person rowing down the river? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you get your yeah. old timer from from uh, from Fayetteville or something like that down there, and they they don't know what's up, but. The, the rowing is definitely a necessity. I leave there every year. I'm like, all right, I got to find some old beater John, but I can fix up and put some, yeah. put some oars on for next year to go up there. <laughs> put a jet on it and you're good to I go. Know. Well, that's just what I need is another boat. <laughs> Add it to the fleet. <laughs> Was there anything else you want to share uh, about, about your striper and shad fishing? No, I think, you, you know, I think 
covered it. Um, we got pretty thorough we, tonight. We got pretty thorough. So if anybody wants to book a trip with you or ask any questions, how can they get up with you? Yeah. So if you're uh, looking to book a trip or have any questions concerning the fishery, um, you can find me on Instagram at Captain Will Paul, C A P T Will Paul. Um, or you can find me on my website um, at www.captwillpaul.com. Sweet. Yeah. Right on. Well, Will, thank you so much for coming on, and uh, it was super fun. We'll have to do another live show from Weldon. We'll get everybody together. Yeah. I'll bring all the gear up there, and we can do a yeah. live show at the house up in Weldon. But, but um, thank, we thank you so much, man. I'm going to jump back over to our camera. Um, well, guys, that was a fun show. Definitely, uh, if you haven't sh shad fish or striper fish before here in North Carolina, do it this, this late winter, this uh, early spring. It's an incredible fishery to tap into. It's a ton of fun, and there's a lot of people doing it, but there's so many fish, and there's so much opportunity, yeah, so much it, water. It's just such a cool thing to see. It's really cool. It is really, really, really fun. It's 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 a lot of fun, and uh, me and Cameron will be up there in Weldon for a little bit this year. I'm, I'm going to do two weeks up there this year, and I don't know what Cameron's, Cameron will probably, probably come down for a couple, couple weekends. weekends. Yeah. yeah. So, well, guys, thank you all so much. Again, this is episode 30-something. It'll say it on the <laughs> podcast. I think it's 32 maybe i think it's 32 32 okay it's either 31 or 32 and thanks for tuning in again next week we're going to be giving away some tickets to the uh the seminar up there at the noose river bait and tackle and uh make sure you tune in for that and check out our instagram please go follow us and if you enjoyed this show um just share it on your facebook it really helps us uh if, as, as your viewers see it and can hop on and uh, we don't make any money doing this. We we do it for fun, and and eventually we 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 want to have this pay, at least pay for itself. Well, eventually, we'll be millionaires. Eventually, we'll be we'll be fishing so. millionaires. But we're trying to figure out a way to help this pay pay its own way. So I'm not <laughs> having to pay all these subscriptions every month for different software junk and all that. But thanks again for tuning in, guys. We love doing it, and we will see y'all next week on episode thirty something as well. Later. <laughs>